الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الناصح الأمين اللهم صل على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد بإذن الله تعالى Before getting started it is very important that as parents we mind our children because we don't want to be a disturbance upon other people where it makes them difficult to have khushur in the salah and it makes it difficult for them to be attentive inside of the class especially for the sisters because their education is tremendously important because they are those who educate our children so it's important for them that they have every access to listen to the classes and to benefit bithilahi ta'ala and from those things which will make that difficult will be for uncontrolled children now children they are going to play and that's good but we have to teach them that there is a time and that there is a place to play. We have to teach them that there is a time, that there is a place. And that doesn't start, that education does not start once we get to the masjid. But you have to train them in the home before coming to the masjid on how to behave when there is a class and the ayat of Allah being recited and the ahadith of the Prophet Wasallam are being recited unto the people to have a great respect for the text and to sit attentively as much as a child can so don't be too hard on them don't cause them to cry in any type of distress but try to educate them and to teach them and to remind them that this is not the time that we play when the class is over when the salah has concluded then you can play it's no problem but not doing the prayer and not doing the lessons and it wasn't my intent to offend anyone, so I don't hope anyone didn't take any offense to what was said. But it had to be said because it had to be said. In any event, as mentioned, inshallah ta'ala, we're not going to spend a, a lot of time in what we want to go over, inshallah ta'ala. So I need everyone to really pay attention, bithnilahi ta'ala. It's going to be like a rapid fire round, as they say. And I want you to keep in mind the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for those taking notes, then I want you to write this one down. There comes a hadith that and it comes inside of Muslim. And it's on the authority of, of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this hadith is a hadith that is Qudsi. Hadith that is Qudsi. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... He makes it very clear that fasting is different. Every action of the son of Adam is for him. Except for fasting. Verily the fasting is for me and I will reward him for it. And then this is the part that I want you to pay very close attention to. Because we're going to keep coming back to it. And that is, Allah Ta'ala, He says, يَدْعُوا شَهْوَتَهُ وَطَعَامَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِي That He leaves off and He abandons His cardinal desires and His food for my sake. Naam? Because what we want to talk about, بِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى are those things that will nullify the fast. Those things that will nullify the fast. So you find that this particular narration will be a proof and evidence for more than one of them. Naam? Because a person will abandon their carnal desires, meaning what? Intercourse, right? And things that produce similar or the same outcome. And as well as their food. And in that, of course, their drink. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the daytime in the month of Ramadan. So the first thing that will nullify the fast will be eating and drinking. 
نعم في الأكل والشرب متعمدا eating and drinking intentionally that's very important and I want to remind you of this eating and drinking intentionally نعم and what's a proof and evidence that we have to leave off eating and drinking intentionally in the month of Ramadan is what? Huh? The Hadith al-Qudsi, right. There's no way we should have blank stairs. I just literally gave you the answer. The Hadith al-Qudsi, it was narrated on the authority of who? Abu Huraira. And what did Allah Ta'ala say in that Hadith? What translated means is what? That a person they leave off and abandon their the carnal desires. And what's the you can't answer no more. You done there like three, four. You gotta open it up. <laughs> uh, what's the it is, it is, but we, you gotta you gotta, you know what I mean? You saving everybody else. They like, nah, nah, he answering it, so I gotta say nothing. No, 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 no. I want I want some hear some more voices. So what's the other one? And they leave off their they leave off their food. And included in that is what? Of course, their drink for who? For Allah, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, okay, so now we understand from that the eating and drinking is what? It will nullify the fast. If a person ate and drink intentionally, then it will nullify their fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in his noble book, Kulu wa shrabu, eat and drink. Hatta yatabayyin lakum al khaytu al abiyadu min al khaytu al aswadi min al fajr. So eat and drink until the, um, the white thread becomes distinct from the black thread of fajr. Meaning what? The ulama, they, they explain what is meant by the white thread becoming distinct from the black thread, meaning waqtul fajr, that the time of fajr has come. Naam? So you eat and drink until fajr time. So that means you can eat and drink until fajr. So eating and drinking after fajr, you can't do it, right? Right? No, not, not doing Ramadan. Why? Because that's the cutoff, but why? What would happen if you ate and you drank? It would nullify your fast. I sent. Right. So also, number two, what enters into that are those things that take the ruling of eating and drinking. So this is a separate category now. The ulama, they number this as, as separate. So those things that take the ruling, that which is in the ruling of eating and drinking, then this what? It will break the... They will break the fast. So what's that? What are those things that are not food but like food? Those things that are food-like. Naam? Anyone has an example? Huh? No. Naam. I sent. There are those things, for example, like if a person were to take any supplement that will... Provide for the nourishment to an extent where they did not have to eat. So for an example, anyone who takes an IV that is on an IV bag, you know, when people get sick and they're hospitalized and they are not able to eat, then they get their nutrients yeah, intravenously. So any type of intravenous type of fluid, like an IV, uh, sure, small. Huh? What's the name? I, literally, I just said it and I totally forgot it. Huh? The injection or the, no, the bag. What's the bag called that hang in there? Huh? The IV, thank you. Nah, the IV. So anyone who takes the IV, no, I just, my mind went blank. I totally forgot about it, uh, the name for it. So the IV, if anyone taking an IV, is going to break your fast. Why? Because it's, uh, as early man they say, yes, يعني, يستغني بها عن الطعام. Because you could, you, you, يعني, you can leave all food and still get your nutrients from it. So it's tantamount of eating. Now, so this is what is meant by that which is tantamount of eating, that this will break the fast. What's the proof of evidence? Hmm? I heard somebody say under their breath. No, we have courage. Say it. He was right. The same hadith. Now, I sent. Why? Because it takes the ruling of eating and drinking. So therefore, those hadith that apply for eating and drinking, and, 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 and the ayah that applies for eating and drinking, then also it applies to that which is tantamount to eating and drinking. It will break the fast. Naam? Right. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, there are some things that there's some difference of opinion on that enter into this that do not break your fast. So like eye drops or ear drops and things of this nature, they do not break your fast. The next thing is what? Al-Qayt. 
al midan to vomit intentionally to intentionally vomit it will break your fast ma'am and this one and inshallah ta'ala another one that if we have time we'll mention it briefly you and likewise you know what even the next one we're going to say after this one but why because when you vomit right and you expel your stomach of its content then you will need in order to be healthy right doing outside ramadan what do you do you replace it because it weakens you so you'll find that there's a common theme amongst those things that we have to stay away from um, while we're fasting and those things that will break our fast anything that will weaken a person such rendering the fast as being harmful for them then we have to avoid it it will break the fast so if a person vomits and then they continue to fast i mean intentionally vomit and continue to fast that may be very very difficult for them so intentional vomiting then this will break the fast right what if a person vomits uh unintentionally is their fast broken you think so you say no you say no Depends. If they, no, no, I'm just saying they, they, it's unintentional. He vomited. No. Okay. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let it hang there for a second. All right, that's it. Time's up. There comes a hadith from the Prophet that has been collected um, in a Tirmidhi. And Sahahu al Albani. Uh, al Albani, he graded it as authentic. Naam. But the Prophet he said, Man dhara'ahu ait ghulabat. That yani ghulabahu al qayt that whoever yani dhara'ahu al qayt they vomit unintentionally naam fala qada alayhi then there he doesn't have to make up the day naam he doesn't have to make up the day wa man istaqa'a fa alayhi al qada but whoever intentionally vomits they cause themselves to vomit they have to make up the day they fast is broke they have to make up the day we know the fast is broke why because he has to make up the day. So he broke the fast. Naam? But, but again, if they unintentionally vomit, it's okay. The fast is, is sound. The fast is sound. Now, if it is a situation that they unintentionally vomit because they are sick, right? Then they're allowed to what? Break the fast and they have an excuse because they're sick. That makes sense? Okay. But unintentional vomit does not break the fast. But intentional vomit breaks the fast. The next one is al hayb wa nifas, menstruation and postpartum bleeding. These are nullifiers of the fast. So if this, if the sister is fasting, and then she gets her menses, her fast becomes broken. Her fast becomes broken, now, and then she has to make up that day. A proof of this. Is a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it comes in Sahih al-Bukhari with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said Alaysa idha hadat lam tusalli wa lam tasum He said is it not such as is it, it is the case that when a woman has her, 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 her menses that she does not pray and she does not fast So we understand from that why? Because you cannot pray or fast when you have your menses for the women So if they get their menses then they have to um, stop. So once the missus comes or the postpartum bleeding, it it, 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 it it comes, the woman has to stop immediately from fasting, even if it was a few moments before Maghrib. And this is by consensus of the ulama. This is by con consensus of the ulama that she must stop. The next one is al istimna'u. This is masturbation that a person will take to its full climax. So if a person manually, outside of intercourse, now outside of intercourse, which is well known, outside of intercourse, but if they will by another means cause um, the fluid to be released due to a climax, then that would break the fast. And this is if it is what? Intentionally, intentionally. So whether the person does it to themselves or whether their spouse performs it for them, it will break their fast and they have to make up that day. Now, they have to make up that day. And this is regardless on how they, they reach that point. 
So they have to make up that day. What's the proof of evidence they have to make up that day? I'll give you a hint. I gave you the answer already. Now, is it a hadith? Excellent. Which one? Which hadith? The one hadith of Qudsi. Now, sent. Which part of the hadith is the point of evidence? He leaves off his desires. Now, he leaves off his carnal desires for the sake of Allah Sa'ala. So, that, so, enters into that intercourse. Now, but our beloved brother, Al Jamaiki, he covered that one. So, so we're going to skip that one. Okay? But this enters into the leaving off of the desires. Now, but. And the last one to mention is ikhraj dam bil hijama. Now, is the expelling of blood or taking out the blood due to cupping, due to cupping. Now, this one, there's a there's a difference of opinion amongst the ulama. The jamhur, the majority of the scholars say it does not break your fast. Now, Imam Ahmed, he his opinion was against the jamhur was against the majority. He said, no, it breaks your fast. Now, it breaks your fast. And this is because we have narrations where cupping was done while fasting. But Sheikh Ben Baz, he explains and brings yani, how we understand between the two things. So, um, the proof in what Imam Ahmed and those who take this opinion, which is the strongest of opinion, that it breaks the fast, is of tara. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Aftar al Hajim wal Mahjum, that they have broken the fast, the cupper and the one who was cupped. They both broke their fast. And this hadith is Sahih, Sahahu al Albani, and is collected by Abu Dawood. Now, so it's a hadith that's authentic. Where the Prophet Sallallahu said, the one who gets cupped and the cupper, they broke their fast. Now, and this is the strongest of the opinions. Imam bin Bas, he mentions, he says, He said that those scholars who يعني, um, study in great detail these type of matters, they have mentioned that that the, that the allowance for the one who was fasting to get cupped has been abrogated because the aforementioned hadith came after the instance where um, the Prophet ﷺ got cut while he was fasting. Now, that ruling became abrogated. And you have others from the Sahaba who they used to get cupped when they were fasting and then they stopped getting cupped while fasting. And they would wait until the night time to get cupped. Now, because this was what was understood is that it's no longer permissible to get cupped while fasting. That makes sense? From that, and likewise, if you go back to the woman or her menses, what we will understand from the, the wisdom, some of the wisdoms is that is that what? Is that the, the, the expelling of this type of blood, it will, it will weaken a person. It will make it very difficult for them. Now, in the case of the woman, she may have severe cramps where they have to take pain medicine. So that will be very difficult for them to fast in that state where they're one being weakened and then they, they have pain. They're, 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 they have pain, right? In the, in the case of one who is being cupped, it will weaken him, which it will make the fast perhaps very difficult for them. So any type of thing that will add any type of difficulty, then you find that these things have to be avoided while fasting uh, from the aforementioned things, like getting cupped, uh, f forcing yourself to vomit, so on and so forth. That makes sense? So now Shaykh Uthaymeen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he brings a very good point because a person will say, okay, I'm getting cupped, no, no problem, I understand what cupping is. Now what about, the Shaykh, he mentions, what about the person, yatabarra' bid dam? What about the person who donates blood? Can you donate blood? Hmm? Falls into, I think it would fall into weakening the body. Now, I sent, falls into the same category. Sheikh Raslan, uh, he mentions, he says, before we mention what Sheikh Rasulullah mentioned, but he mentions, he says it's not permissible because he said it will uh, affect the body similar to how hijama affects the body. Now, it will affect the body in a similar manner. And Sheikh Rasulullah, he mentions in Majal al-Shahr al-Ramadan 
that and وعلى هذا لا يجوز الصائم أن يتبرع بالدم. He said it's not permissible for the one who was fasting to give blood. نعم. It's not permissible for him to give blood. But if there's a situation where there is an emergency and you know that you have the type of blood that is needed and they can't get it from other places, maybe it's a rare type of blood they ran out, but you have it. Can you get blood? Yes, you can get blood. There's no sin upon you, but you have to make up that day later. Now, but you can give, but you can give uh, uh, blood. So, and Shirat Rahman he mentions this as well that if there's an emergency, then then you can give blood. But you would, they would have broken the fast, no sin upon them because of due to the emergency, they would just make that day up after Ramadan. Now, that makes sense. And when you make up days, that has to be when. After Ramadan Person can't come and say Oh no actions are by intention So I'm going to intend to uh, fast two days and one day Two for one I'm going to fast for this day And for the day I, I missed last week Because I was sick so I'm, But I'm going to do both today Can you do that? No Have to make it up After Ramadan Now Now Oh yeah no matter of fact Hold, hold that real fast Because I said rapid fire That's it Next up We have the Qadr وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرا